Well, good Monday morning, beautiful person. You are listening to Things I Learned on Sunday, a recalling of insights I've gathered through discussion, observation, and the example of others. Now, the purpose of this podcast is that you'd share in the spiritual impact of these lessons along with me while you begin your day and hopefully impart some spiritual insight to start your week off right. Welcome. So before I get into the things that I learned on Sunday, we had a great time on vacation. And we were on vacation all last week. We did a whole lot of very little. We sat on the beach. We listened to the waves. We read. We did a ton of reading. And we just enjoyed going out to eat at different seafood places and being together. It was a very good way to step back and look at things from afar when normally you're working 24-7, 365. It was just a good chance to step back and relax. And there were two things that I learned while I was on my vacation that I wanted to share. The first... um, I read a book called Replenish. It was a book that Philip actually recommended, which is an excellent book. And this book is written by, you may know, Rick Warren. He was the author of The Purpose Driven Life. This book was written by an executive minister at the church where, at the time, Rick Warren was the, I don't know if you'd call him the lead minister or the main minister, but it was written by this man in that church, uh, the Saddleback Church. And this book is really about keeping your cup full as a minister and not letting your mask get too far away from who you actually are. And so there's two things that I really learned through the reading of this book. Number one was that I need to actually work less, that I have been devoting so much time to work within the ministry that my work was suffering. You know, it's like you begin to redline and that's not good for your car. It starts to break down. It overheats. Bad things happen. And so pushing your car into the red line for a long period of time, while it may get you somewhere faster, in the long run, it's not sustainable and it isn't productive. And I would consider that there are a lot of parallels between my own life at this stage and running the red line in my car. So that's the first thing I learned is that I need to actually work less and I need to double down on the things that are really productive um, and bringing people to Christ. I mean, that's what it ultimately comes down to. So the, the areas where this is working and has the greatest potential to be working are areas I need to double down on. And then there are things that I need to shed so I'm not in the red line so that the things that I am doing are being the most productive. And then the second thing that I learned on vacation that I wanted to share was I need to spend more time with God alone. Since I was 18 and in ministry, the majority of the time that I spend directly in action of praying or of reading my Bible was in preparation of serving others, of of serving the church. And that's always been the case, and it's fluctuated here and there how much autonomous spiritual time that I spend for myself. And going back to the first thing that I learned, I need to work less. A side effect of working too much is that I wasn't spending that time with God alone. I wasn't taking the time to commune with God, just like scheduling an appointment to be with God. I was not doing that as much as I should. So Those are the two main things that I learned over the break, and it was a very good spiritual reckoning for me because the work wasn't done, just the realizations were made. And so it was a very good spiritual reckoning for me, and uh, I am in the process of trying to implement the understanding 
of these two things and I need to work less and I need to spend more time with God alone. But all in all, it was an excellent vacation. So things I learned on Sunday, I'm going to cheat a little bit and this will actually be the Sunday that we were on vacation. So a few weeks ago, we decided to go to the Fort Walton Beach Church of Christ. This is only like I don't know, like 10 minutes from Okaloosa Island off the south coast of Florida near Destin, Florida. And so we go to this church and first of all, going to church as a minister, when you just get to sit in the audience and you have no responsibilities, no real accountability is a beautiful thing because you get to focus 100% on what's being said in the sermon. You get to focus 100% on worshiping God, which is embarrassingly something that I don't do. And so it was nice to be able to do that on this trip. What was really cool about this church service was that the minister, whenever he would say something that was somewhat profound, someone would say, "Uh uh-huh. And then he would say something else that was profound, like, I am a recovering self-aholic. And you'd hear someone in the audience say, that's right. And then he would say, we need to always be completely open with God about where our sins lie. And they'd be like, amen. And you continued to hear this through the entire church service. And there was a a palpable energy that occurred from the encouragement that happened throughout the audience during this And I noticed that it brought something to the service that we don't have at sunset. And what's interesting is that the minister, Philip can't bring that. None of the other ministers can bring that. That has to be brought by the church family. And so they had this within that church and it brought an incredible air of energy It made me think of Hebrews chapter 10. This is verses 23 through 25, and this is going to be really the first thing I learned that Sunday. Hebrews chapter 10, 23 says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, as the minister was receiving this encouragement from the audience, and as I felt the palpable energy in the room, it made me think specifically of verse 24. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. You see, in this situation, the minister was preaching truth and people were spurring him on. But not only did it spur him on, the the realization, people saying, you're right, this is true. People affirming what he was saying was not only spurring him on, but it was spurring me on. And just as I assume it was spurring on the church as a whole, that palpable energy was this idea that the church could see him moving forward towards truth. And because he was moving forward towards truth, they wanted to champion that direction that he was moving in. And it's a reminder. It's a safe place. There's a security in knowing that everyone is moving in the right direction and saying and championing the fact that you're moving in the right direction. Now, how does this apply to us today? You'll notice in verse 24, it says how we may spur one another on. And there's a very specific way that we need to consider how to spur one another on. And that is toward love and good deeds. So a little different, slightly different than what I saw on that Sunday morning is we need to specifically champion one another. We need to spur one another on whenever we see someone 
moving in the direction of love and good deeds. So here's really the first thing I learned from going to this church and seeing the energy and listening to this minister and seeing the people champion him. This is the first thing I learned. When I witness someone moving forward, moving towards love in action, I need to champion them on in that direction. So when I witness someone moving towards love in action, I need to champion them on in that direction. Because that's what that's really what verse 24 is saying. You're looking for ways you're looking to consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. So when you witness someone moving towards love in action, when you witness someone taking some kind of action that is loving others, oh my gosh, we need to champion them on in that direction like geese honking towards the lead geese, goose, to continue moving forward. So when you witness someone moving towards love in action, champion them on in that direction, not only will it give them energy and not only will you have been doing your act of service to help them move towards love, but it will also give you energy to be serving, to be filling that role of the person who champions those that are moving in the direction of love. When you witness someone moving towards love in action, champion them on in that direction. The second thing that I learned on that Sunday, and this would have also been on our uh, vacation, was not in the church building. It was whenever we were laying on the beach and listening to the waves and reading, and I had picked up a book from a secular author, a new book called Beyond Order by the author Jordan B. Peterson. And I had read, read a book of his probably a year ago called 12 Rules for Life. And this is sort of an extension of that book called Beyond Order. And what I find so interesting about Jordan Peterson is that he is a secular author. He's not a Christian man. I find it really interesting as a side note, when you ask him if he believes in God, his answer is very interesting, and it's this. I act as though I believe that I do. Is that how he says it? Do you believe in God? I act as that I act as if I believe in God. Something to that effect. I act as I'm, I'm going to have to fact check that now. I, I live my life as if I do believe in God. I think that's basically what he says. You might fact check me on that. But, but his point is, or, or at least my observation of the point, is that he's not saying that he believes in God, but that he's going to live his life as if he does believe that there is a God. That's kind of interesting. But what you find is that um, through a lot of his content is that he holds a, a lot of, um, as a secular man, a lot of reverence for the word of God, for the values and beliefs that come along with Christianity. Um, and in this book, you see a plethora of Christian principles and again, he's not speaking as someone who is a Christian. So one thing that he talks about in this chapter that I read on Sunday was the, the overwhelming, fairly conclusive amount of research and data that shows that those who live together before marriage, that those marriages have a greater propensity to end in divorce by an overwhelming factor than those marriages where the two people did not live together before they got married. And it's pretty cool to hear this stance and to hear someone champion this concept of not living together before marriage, who again does not consider themselves to be a Christian. And it made me think of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, which simply says 
that marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. And what I thought was interesting was his reasoning behind why those who live together before marriages, those marriages are much more likely statistically to end in divorce. What his reasoning behind that was, and his reasoning was, if for those who don't live together before marriage, because what we're really talking about here when we're talking about not living together before marriage, we're talking about not having sex before marriage. You would be a strange individual. You would be in a great, overwhelming minority of people to live together before you eventually get married and not have sex. So living together before marriage is sort of code for we're going to have regular sex before marriage. And Jordan Peterson's thought process behind this st statistical division between these two types of people, those who cohabitate before marriage and those who don't, was that those who make the decision to not have sex before marriage, they are proclaiming that they honor marriage because sex has such a strong drive behind it. Now, I'm saying this in my own words. This is what I took from what he said, that sex, the desire to have sex is a very primal instinct, right? I mean, for, for the healthy individual, it's a ball rolling down a hill. And so to, to curb that temptation or curb that desire with the idea in mind that you're going to wait until marriage to have sex, that whether you make the outward verbal proclamation or not, it's an undeniable proclamation that you have a feeling of honor for the institution of marriage. So think about that for a moment. You take two people who make the decision that they're going to live together and have sex together regularly before marriage, and they're not making that type of honor proclamation of what they think of the institution of marriage. But those who make the decision that they love each other, their boyfriend, girlfriend, they're seeing each other regularly, they are exclusive, and maybe they've even talked about marriage, but they're not going to live together, they're not going to have regular sex before marriage, that's pretty powerful. That's saying that I am saving that for you, and subsequently, most likely, someone that holds that belief, if they're a Christian especially, not only am I going to save that for you, or if I have had sex, I am going to to use a scriptural term, I'm going to repent as a baptized believer and I'm going to make the decision to be anew because God washes me anew and I am now pure, that I am now going to recommit to not have sex with anyone else during our relationship. I'm going to have sex with you when we're married and while we're married for the rest of our years, I'm not going to have sex with anyone else. It is an undeniable proclamation of the honor that you feel for the institution of marriage because of what a powerful commitment you are making that is completely absent if you make the decision to cohabitate and live together before marriage. So the, the second truth that I learned on Sunday was an undeniable proclamation of the honor that you feel for the institution of marriage is abstinence. An undeniable, nobody's going to deny whether they agree with you or not, how you feel about the institution of marriage. If you make the decision to remain abstinent with that person that you're with. It's an undeniable proclamation of the honor you feel for the institution of marriage 
and that's abstinence. This brings me to number three, and this uh, this truth that I learned this last Sunday came from my students, which many of the truths that I learn do come from my students. And this one was came from a question from the Sermon Sunday. The question was, are you involved or are you committed as a Christian? Now, Ellie, and I got permission to be able to use their names and information, but Ellie made the point that, you know, it's a really cool distinction, the two words, involvement and commitment. And she would say that when she looks at it like that, and Ellie, I hope I'm getting this right, when she looks at it like that, when she uses the word commitment rather than involvement, she said it takes her back to camp and that maybe she's more so involved the rest of the time in her Christian walk. And I really appreciate the authenticity in that statement. But when she was at camp, that's when she felt like she went into the realm of commitment. And I asked her, well, why do you think it is that when you're at camp, you are more committed than you are involved as a Christian? And she said, well, it's because you are around other Christians. And I mean, that goes perfectly back to the first truth that I learned at the Fort Walton Beach Church of Christ. When you witness someone moving towards love and action, you champion them on in that direction. Well, if you have an entire group of believers whose meditative focus for an entire week is to live their lives for God and serve God, then you're constantly going to have people that are witnessing others moving towards love and action and you're constantly going to be championing each other forward. And to, to hear it from Ellie's perspective, it made me realize that is one of the reasons why camp is so powerful. And then the second point uh, Matt made was, well, maybe another reason why you're more committed than you are involved at camp is because your focus is very clear as opposed to more so vague in your everyday life. Proverbs 16, 1 through 5, it says, To humans belong the plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the proper answer of the tongue. All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Commit to the Lord, whatever you do, there's that word commit, and he will establish your plans. The Lord works out everything to its proper end, even the wicked for a day of disaster. The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this. They will not go unpunished. So with Matt's point, because your focus is very clear as opposed to more so vague in everyday life, um, that's one of the reasons why you're more committed during camp. We see here that all a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. And when you're at camp, part of the reason why you can be so clear and focused is because you're accounting more for the weighing of your motives by God. And you're in a bubble. I mean, it's easy to account for the weighing of your motives by God. It's easy to think about the fact that God is weighing your motives, as he says in verse 2. All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. It's easier to think about that because your motives are probably pretty dang pure whenever you're at church camp and you're in this submersive bubble of those trying to live for God. So that brought me to this third truth. There is a direct correlation between your accounting for the weighing of your motives by God and your moving with a more attuned focus in the right direction. So there's a direct correlation between your accounting for the weighing of your motives by God because we're already told in Proverbs chapter 16 that God, he is, he is, uh, he is accounting our, our motives, excuse me, we need to account for our motives. God is weighing our motives. That's what we learned from Proverbs chapter 16, because all a person's seem, ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. So there is an accounting of the weighing of those motives that if you have that, 
if you're accounting for the fact that whatever you do, God is weighing those motives, and you think about how God might be weighing those motives as a Christian with your limited understanding of God through the word of God, then that correlation between your accounting of the weighing of those motives by God will mean that you move with a more, atto- a more attuned focus in the right direction. And so, of course, it's so obvious that when you're at camp, now it's obvious, now that we've had the discussion, that when you're at camp, and Ellie and Matt are certainly both correct, that when you're at camp, you're around other Christians and you're all spurring one another on, there's an encouragement there that's palpable and powerful. And then also, because your focus is so clear rather than the way it is in your everyday life. There's a direct correlation between your accounting for the weighing of your motives by God and your moving with a more attuned focus in the right direction. Those are the things that I learned on Sunday. I hope you learned a little bit from them as well. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you haven't already, subscribe and tickle that little notification bell to be notified of spiritually nourishing content appearing regularly. Consider commenting so we, you and I, can grow this community outside these four digital walls. Make a great day today. Make a great week by serving and allowing your bright light to be seen all week. Until next time. (laughs) 